much. Thank you for coming along. There are no servers in this talk, but serverless is next door. So if everybody's in the right place, let's get going. I'm Tim Duckett. Currently, I'm head of engineering at FinLeap. We are a fintech company builder. Uh, we have a big stand upstairs with the Jenga, um, actively hiring. Come along and talk to us. And that's my contractual obligation speech done. <laughs> so I'm going to start the story almost exactly three years ago, almost to the day. And this is some actual live archive footage of my life at that point. A burning garbage truck driving uncontrolled through mud is actually a pretty good metaphor for what was going on at the time. In the four months leading up to around about this time in three years ago, I lost 15 kilograms in body weight, and I'm not really a big guy to begin with. A bottle of whiskey would last me about a week, and I was on first name terms with a lady at the corner shop who used to sell me my cigarettes, because we spoke pretty much every day. And the reason for all of that was this. If you're from Berlin or Paris, you'll recognize this as a coupe. It's a battery-powered electric scooter that you can rent by the minute, and it's possibly the best way to have fun on two wheels in Berlin with your clothes on. <laughs> this being Berlin, there are other ways to have fun on two wheels with your clothes off, but that's a separate presentation. This was pretty much the project from hell. It was the absolute ideal definition of an immovable deadline meets an irresistible product manager. It was an absolute shit show. Death March. We absolutely had to launch in summer because, let's face it, who wants to ride around on two wheels in Berlin in the winter, regardless of how many clothes you're wearing? It was a complete death march. This is what I looked like at the start of the project. And this is what I looked like at the end. <laughs> the absolute low point was waking up one morning, sending an email saying, I'm not going to come in today, deleting Slack from my phone, and then sleeping for two days straight. And when I came back from this, I kind of started asking questions about, OK, what, what, what's, what, what was going on there? What happened? And it became pretty clear that I'd burnt out. Now, I was the kind of annoying child who used to take clocks to bits to see how they worked. So I wanted to understand just what the fuck had happened. So I read lots of books, talked to lots of people, generally tried to figure out what was going on. And the net result of that is this. It is an engineer's guide to burnout and how to hack it. However, I want to start with what we're going to look at. What is it? What does burnout actually mean? What causes it? And what can we actually do to prevent it happening in the first place, or at least deal with it while it's happening if we can't prevent it? There is, however, a caveat to all of this. I am not a doctor, I am not a psychiatrist, nor am I a scientist. So basically all of this you kind of need to just bear that in mind. However, if you're happy with all that, then let's take a look at this. So where did all this come from, the origins of burnout? Well, the first kind of really recorded use of the term was actually in a book. This is Graham Greene, he's an English, or was an English novelist. Um, this is a light romantic comedy set in the late 1950s in a leper colony in the Belgian Congo. Um, I'm actually lying, it's not light romantic comedy at all. They all die at the end, it's terrible, don't read it. Um, but about the same time, in the caring professions, particularly nursing, people were noticing something that 
people would come into the profession with the best of intentions, and after a few years, they would become really sort of cynical and don't give a shit, and I'm not going to help people, and something was going wrong. And the same thing is true, they found, in education as well. And if you think back to your high school experience, you'll have had some teachers who were enthusiastic and motivated, and then there were some who just appeared to, like, hate kids. The thing is, it also happens in our industry as well, and we've got tools to visualize it. People start with the best of intentions, look at all those commits, look at those streaks, and then something happens, and it always goes to shit. And the symptoms look something like this. Emotional exhaustion. I just don't give a shit anymore. I can't be bothered. And a detached attitude. Yeah, whatever. You know, I don't care. And a low sense of achievement. It doesn't matter what I do. It's not going to make any difference. Who cares? And that leads to some things. It leads to poor performance, obviously. But it also is a gateway to some really quite serious conditions. And anxiety and depression, they're, they're, they're real things. They're medical conditions. What's the cause of all this? Chronic long-term stress. Great. So what I've actually done is I've basically just replaced one set of terms with another set of terms, which isn't very helpful. So let, let's go and look at stress and see what that's all about. So this is a dictionary definition. Pressure or tension, mm, not really. State of mental or emotional strain, yep, that sounds familiar. There are multiple causes of stress in our lives. You can have acute physical crises. You fall over and you break your leg. That's pretty stressful. Then there can be chronic physical crises. You develop some kind of long-term illness. Again, pretty damn stressful. But neither of those really apply to me and probably don't apply to too many people in the room. But this one, psychological and social disruptions, yeah, we can all relate to that one. Now, there is, interestingly, a scientific way of measuring this. It's called the Social Readjustment Rating Scale. Um, it was invented in 1967. And basically, some researchers looked at the various things that could happen in your life and worked out which were the most stressful. And right at the top is death of a spouse, but death of a partner. And that's, yeah, that's pretty damn stressful. I think we can all agree with that one. But it's interesting, when you look at the work-related ones, Lots of things that are work-related appear in this as well. Even some things which you might anticipate having positive connotations. Um, changing responsibilities, a promotion. Promotion's a good thing, right? We all want those. But they can be stressful as well. So, why? Okay, time for some science. This is the central nervous system. Um, Inside your head is the brain. Um, if you want to use an analogy, you can think of that as being um, the central processing unit, your EC2 instance. And running down the back is the spinal column. That's kind of like a messaging bus, I guess, if you, if you want to really sort of torture this analogy. But the central nervous system sits on top of the peripheral nervous system, which is the bit that kind of gets the nerve signals out to the, 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 bits, at the, the bits at the ends, out of the brain into elsewhere. And there's actually two sets of nervous systems running at any one time. Now, I'm standing here talking to you, which is actually quite a complex series of motions. I'm controlling my muscles, my diaphragm is forcing air, I'm varying the stretchiness of my vocal cords, I'm waving my hands, I'm pacing up and down. But at the same time, I'm still breathing. I think, yes, yes, I'm still breathing. My heart is still beating. I'm still digesting lunch, and I'm not thinking about any of those things, and that's the autonomic nervous system taking over. Now, then in the autonomic system, we can actually break this apart into sort of two other parts. There's basically two ways of looking at this. There's the parasympathetic nervous system. That handles things that are loosely grouped under the heading of rest or digest. 
So it's the parasympathetic nervous system that manages my gut, for example. And then there is the sympathetic nervous system, which handles everything related to fight or flight. Now, hang on to that phrase, because we'll come back to that in a second. This is the brain, um, hopefully as close as you'll get to ever seeing your own brain. Um, on average, weighs about one and a half kilograms. Um, it's got the consistency of the custard that you get in the middle of a pudding bretzel. Um, so tomorrow morning when you go to the bakery, just, just bear that one in mind. Um, it's possibly the most complex biological structure on the planet that we know of, which by implication also means it's the most complex biological structure in the known universe, which is kind of interesting. If you look at how the brain is organized, there's a, a model called the triune brain. And basically, it's the idea that the brain is a series of almost like Russian dolls. Um, there's an outside, and there's an inside, and there's something inside that as well. Um, on the outside, there's the neocortex. And this is the bit that makes us human. This is where the sense of self comes from. It's the bit that allows us to come up with a concept of philosophy. Um, it's the bit that recognizes that it's you in the mirror, which interestingly other mammals without this brain structure can't do. Also handles things like complex language processing. It's basically what makes us human. Then in the middle, we've got the mammalian brain. And this is common to all the higher life forms. And this is where social behavior, parental behavior, is controlled. So for example, dogs, cats have a mammalian brain, but they don't really have a neocortex as such. But then, right down at the bottom, is the reptilian brain. And the reason it's called the reptilian brain is because it's exactly the same structure that you find in reptiles. Reptiles have been around for millions of years, and basically over time, the brain has evolved by adding these layers on as we've got steadily more capable. Um, it's a bit like technical debt in some ways. What the reptilian brain does is handle the survival instinct. It's, it's dealing with, if you like, the CPU interrupts of life. And it's the basic response to stress situations. It's the thing that keeps you going. Um, now, first takeaway of the afternoon, in the event of a zombie apocalypse, always aim for the reptilian brain, because it's the reptilian brain that controls the basic life forms. Zombies don't have neocortexes, you're just wasting ammunition. <laughs> the stress response, the reptilian brain, is handled there's basically four ways that the, the reptilian brain can handle this, and they are usually called the four Fs. And the first F is freeze, which is kind of counterintuitive, because something is coming along that's going to eat you. Freezing, just standing still, doesn't really seem to make much sense. But it relies on the fact that vision, particularly interpreting patterns, is really, really computationally expensive for the brain. So a lot of higher predators actually work on movement. If you've seen Jurassic Park, the T-Rex freeze based on science. Second takeaway of the day, T-Rex attacks, stand still, won't see you. The second F is flight, just get the fuck out of there. It's run away, and this is particularly effective if you're a herd animal, because on average, you're not going to be the slowest, and you're not going to be the fastest. The next takeaway for this afternoon, how to deal with bear attack. Very important in Berlin. <laughs> Berlin. Yeah, OK. Oh, no, never mind, never mind. It sounded funny when I rehearsed it. Basically, be with somebody who can't run as fast as you can. <laughs> Failing that, you can go for the third F, which is fight. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're a big thing with, with, with spiky things on your head, you know, maybe that is a, that's, that's a, that's a, a good response. And then the fourth F is reproduction, um, <laughs> which is actually a stress response of a kind. Now, the interesting thing about stress responses is that they can be provoked in some interesting kind of ways. So uh, what I want you to do 
you pay very, very close attention to the next slide. Everybody ready? What the fuck was that? <laughs> Very simple. It's all about getting energy to where it's needed. This is what's just happened to you. First of all, your brain has just dumped adrenaline into your bloodstream. You've heard of the adrenaline rush. This is where it comes from. The next thing that happens is that that adrenaline triggers the release of glucose into your bloodstream your pancreas kicks into gear. Your heart rate increases. If we were measuring your heart rates, so I can see some of you looking at your Apple Watches. If you measure your heart rate, it's probably running slightly faster than it was before I put that slide up there. Why? Because that was a stress situation. Nobody likes looking over the edge of something very, very tall. It's kind of hardwired. Your respiration will increase to get the blood through, get the, sorry, get the oxygen into the blood and to get the energy to where it's needed, all of which is about maximizing the chances of getting away. And at the same time, some other things are going on. Your senses become sharpened. You've heard the cliche of, I could have heard a pin drop. That's exactly what that means. Your attention becomes focused to something that's the, the, the really important things which is incidentally why eyewitness accounts are so utterly useless in finding out what actually went wrong. In most stress situations, your, your attention is focused very, very firmly on the threat, and you completely ignore the surroundings. Also, your pain threshold increases, which is where we get the stories of people who lose limbs in horrible farming equipment accidents and then pick the severed limb up and walk to the emergency room, put it on the table and say, sew that back on, please. <laughs> All of which is about getting away. The other thing that's going on is you're deferring lots of long-term expensive stuff. Your digestion slows down. You don't need to digest lunch if you're running away from a bear because there's a very real chance that the bear will catch you and well, you'll be lunch. Your immune system gets suppressed. Why worry about viruses when there's a bear over there? Likewise, libido. Again, haven't really got time for that kind of thing if, if there's a predator coming up behind you. All of which leads to the fundamental problem that humans trigger acute short-term responses in chronic long-term situations. Now, it's actually not that surprising because this is the vision that we're sold of our beautiful, peaceful, organized workplace. This is the reality. <laughs> Familiar? Anybody work there? I know I have. So, what's the long-term implications of all these short-term responses? Well, if your heart rate and blood pressure is constantly raised, you are going to develop hypertension. High blood pressure over the long term is really, really damaging to a large number of your internal organs. If your blood glucose is always raised, you're probably going to end up with type 2 diabetes. Slowing digestion, irritable bowels, suppressed immune system, you're constantly going to have big minor illnesses, those annoying colds. Impaired sex drive, well, yeah, that's obvious. And enhanced senses 
is where we start to get towards more serious, potentially psychiatric disorders like anxiety and depression. So, that was all a bit depressing. What can we do about it? Well, the good news is that there are things we can do about it. There are, however, some shitty ways to deal with stress. Alcohol, it has some quite interesting short-term effects, but long-term alcohol consumption does you no good at all. Um, tobacco, even worse. What's more relaxing than a cigarette? Long-term damage. Narcotics, I mean, you know, just get high. That's one option. Or you could just masochism, just, just, just go through it. Don't even try to do anything about it. What about some better ways? Well, the good news is, according to real science, just by knowing something about this stuff, you are already more equipped to deal with it. So if you want, you can get up and leave now, and you're still in a better position than you were when you walked in the room. How's that? But if you want to really take control of this, you've, you've got to kind of be a bit logical about this. The first thing you want to know is how burned out am I? You know, is, is this actually a serious problem? Then you want to think about what's causing it. And then with those two chunks of information, you're in a position to say, okay, what can I do to perhaps try and fix this? Then what I will talk about is some very quick hacks that you can use to just reduce immediate stress levels. Some psychological hacks that you can use to help yourself deal with things on a more long-term basis. And then hacking your sympathetic nervous system, which is kind of like the 911 emergency, oh my god, things are going wrong, I need to do something now response. So, let's have a look at how stressed we are. And the good news is that there is a tool for this. It's called the Maslach Burnout Inventory. It's available online. Um, unlike the Myers-Briggs Inventory, which is basically horoscopes for HR, and has no scientific validity whatsoever, it's total bullshit, this is actually real peer-reviewed scientific stuff. It measures you on three scales, Emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and personal accomplishment. Per, sorry, personal accomplishment. And by answering a series of questions, grading yourself on this, it gives you a indication of where you are on this scale. And it's actually kind of useful first step to know how big a problem this is. The second thing you can do is you can use something with the wonderful, wonderful name of the yerkes dodson law. Um, basically, you've got two axes here. On the, on the, 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 the x-axis, you've got arousal, um, which is psychologists speak for stress. And then on the y-axis, you've got performance. And the theory behind the yerkes dodson law is that you need a bit of pressure in your life just to keep things going along. Um, we do this all the time with deadlines. Um, I was editing these slides quite late last night. <laughs> yeah, because I had a deadline and I put it off for weeks and weeks and weeks and I just needed that extra bit of push. What you can do with the Yerkes Dodson law is you can look at your stress situation and your performance and it will look something like this. This is kind of what it looks like for me. So if I have no pressure at all, I'm kind of bored. It's just a bit sort of, yeah, whatever. As things kind of get a bit more pressured, a little bit more going on, yeah, I'm starting to get effective now. Yeah, this is, I'm in the sweet spot now. You know, it's, it's the right balance between deadlines and what I've got to achieve, and I'm just all, all there. Okay, now it's gone over the other side. How do I know? Because all of a sudden I find myself with a cigarette in my hand. I have no recollection of buying them. I have no recollection of lighting it. All I know is I'm smoking it, okay? Warning bell. Um, when the whiskey comes out, okay, yeah, things, you know, mm -hmm, maybe we've got a problem here, and then, 
So what you can do with the yerkes dodson law is you can look at how you've reacted in the past and how your levels of stress were at that time, and you can use this as an early warning device to try and catch things before they get to the point of needing to fix. Now, here are some simple things you can do right now, almost, to fix stress situations. Before you need to go seek professional help, pharmacologists, ph pharmaceuticals, anything like that, there are some simple things you can do. Sleep. Right, now, you're probably sitting there thinking, what, I, 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 I could be in serverless right now. I'm sitting here and he's telling me to just go to sleep? Who, who is this jerk? Yeah. If I told you that sleep deprivation is banned under the Geneva Convention as a form of torture, does that change your opinion slightly? There are lots of studies, um, including some quite unpleasant ones involving rats, um, to look at the effects of sleep deprivation. Um, and what they've discovered is that in, in the Western lifestyle, we are chronically sleep deprived, as just, just as a civilization. Um, we've caused all kinds of problems for ourselves with electric light and blue screens, and it, it's, it's a real, real problem. And if you should ever find yourself in the midst of an acute psychiatric crisis, which involves hospital treatment, one of the very first things that the treatment staff will do is try and stabilize your sleep cycle. Because most people come in during acute psychiatric crises chronically sleep deprived. Eight hours is the optimal, that's science. And there's loads and loads of studies that say eight hours. It's not just your mom saying that, it really is true. One sleepless night has the same impact on your cognitive functions as being legally drunk. So just think about that. The next time you pull all nighter, the following day, you're sat at your screen pissed. It takes longer than a weekend to recover as well. There's, there's science on this one as well. It takes longer than 48 hours to recover from the sleep debt that you build up during the week. And interestingly, cultures without artificial light fall into a biphasic sleep pattern. What they tend to do is they tend to sleep for eight hours during the night and then two hours during the day, which I think is an excellent idea. Siestas are definitely the way forward. Eating. Ah, oh, currywurst. Yeah. Eating is the first thing to go on a project crunch, right? The pizzas get ordered in. Pizza's just the, the absolute worst thing you can be eating, really. It's, it's, it, it's just nutritionally so dodgy. There's just no nutritional value in pizza whatsoever. However, the big killer, and this is, again, a problem of the Western lifestyle, is this stuff, sugar. Um, I actually did the calculations. A 500 milliliter bottle of Coke, one of the big ones, full-fat Coke, has 54 grams of sugar in it. If you, if you were ladling that into your coffee, that's 13 and a half spoons of sugar. Um, we, we, yeah, you see people looking at the bottles now thinking, shit. <laughs> now, the problem with sugar is, well, first of all, high glycemic foods, foods which are, are high in sugar, they activate the reward centers of the brain in very, very similar ways to narcotics. So it's a little bit like taking a sugary heroin hit every time you take a slug of Coke. Um, elevated blood glucose levels slow down your cognitive functions. Um, again, there's, there's, there's lots of science on this one, that if you feed people lots of sugar, they're slower at doing, at, at doing cognitive tasks. And hypoglycemia, which is, the, is the, the technical name for high blood sugar, is also positively correlated with increased levels of anxiety. So, yeah, again, your mom was right. It's really bad for you. Moving. Now, I'm not advocating that you should, you know, 
don your leotard and, and do that kind of thing. But if you're in a project crunch situation, it's all too easy to spend hours and hours and hours hunched over the console, which is, again, hideously bad for you. It's a Western lifestyle. We spend far too much time sitting. We were never designed for it. The good thing about movement is that exercise reduces the stress-related neurotransmitter release. Again, science. And the endorphins that get released with vigorous physical activity have exactly the same effect on the brain as narcotics, which is one of the reasons why you, you, you get the, the cliche about the runner's high. And it's absolutely true. It's like needle into the vein, away you go. And then focusing. It's, yeah, it's kind of a bit of a fuzzy topic, this one. But again, some specific things you can do. This is my dog. This is Senka. She is a, an office dog. She comes into the office quite frequently. Um, why? Because there's peer-reviewed science that says that stroking dogs releases oxytocin into the bloodstream. Oxytocin is the same chemical, the same neurotransmitter that gets released into the bloodstream when you see a loved one. Um, everybody gets less stressed. Highly recommended. And then you move into the, 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 this is where it starts to get a bit more potentially religious, the mindfulness. Your opinions on this may vary. Personally, I've never really been able to get on with meditation because it just involves emptying my mind and, and that's just, I find that really hard. But it must work because, let me find the figures here, Calm closed its last round at $88 million and it's currently valued at $1 billion. It's a meditation app worth $1 billion. They must be doing something right, yeah? Okay, so what about some psychological hacks that you can use to, to deal with specific in situ situations? And these are quite useful when the, you, you're, you're eating right, you're sleeping right, everything is there, but you're still in this kind of stress situation. What are the things that you can do? Well, one of the techniques that's used a lot in psychotherapy is called labeling. Um, and basically the idea is that you actually look at how you're feeling right now and you give it a name. You actually apply an adjective to it. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm stressed, I'm angry. Because what that does is it engages some of the higher level brain functions, the executive brain, and it kind of disrupts the intensity of the emotion. And the thing is, it's something you can do internally. You don't have to tell people that you're doing this, but you can just step back, give it a name, and just by describing the emotion in a word or two, it can break the cycle that can lead on to other things. The other thing you can do is something called reframing. And this is quite useful in conflict situations, which is where a lot of stress builds up, particularly in agile situations, which are kind of agile teams are almost guaranteed to cause emotional um, interpersonal conflict. It's a technique to expose different options or paths to kind of break you out of this I don't know what to do um, stasis loop that you, you can get locked into. Um, describing the situation from someone else's point of view to try and describe what's going on from their perspective either by changing from an active to a passive way of describing things or changing from future to past instead of what might happen, what did happen. Again, that can help to break you out of those cycles of the cycles that you, you can sometimes find yourself in. And these are both techniques that are extensively used in, in psychotherapy, particularly in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, is one of the first line treatments for stress related problems. Control 
is very important in managing stress levels. And again, this is used in evil ways. If you're ever unfortunate enough to be in a situation where you are being interrogated by a hostile questioner, one of the things a professional interrogator will do is to remove control from you. They will control whether the lights are on and off. They will control when you sleep, when you eat, who you see, what you do. Because by losing control, it has a very significant impact on your ability to deal, to, to handle situations. And feeling like you're out of control is a classic symptom of stress. It's a classic symptom of burnout, particularly in the later stages when you feel like there's just nothing I can do about this. I've lost control, I'm screwed. There is a technique that you can use called the three control questions. Look at the situation and ask yourself, what is there in the situation that I cannot control? As you can probably tell by the accent, I'm British. There is fuck all I can do about Brexit. There's nothing I can do. I still get stressed about it because it's kind of important, but by looking at it and saying, okay, here is something that I just have to let go, there's nothing I can do about this, it almost gives me the right, it gives me the, the permission to say, okay, I'm just going to park that, I'm not going to worry about it. Then you have the circle of things that you're trying to control. It's called the circle of influence. The things that you can have an effect on. And this is very often things like your team. You can't make people do things, but you can influence them towards doing things. And this is the area of things that you should keep an eye on, but be prepared to move them back into the circle of concern if there are things that you just can't get people to do. And then the third one is, what are the things that I could control that I'm not actually controlling right now? What is it that I can do to fix the situation? And one of the things that you'll find in psychotherapy is that they, there's, there's a phrase used called small goals. If you can get down to inbox zero just by deleting a lot of stuff, it's a very small victory, but very small victories build up. They give you a sense of being in control of your own destiny, reduce your stress levels, and therefore reduce the risk of burnout. But there are situations where it's a shitstorm, you need to do something right now, when you really need to take control of the situation immediately. This is the break glass in case of emergency scenario. And in case you think this is all new age waffle, this is a technique by, used by these gentlemen. Um, these are US Navy SEALs, the elite fighting force of the US Navy. Um, I think you will agree with me that they are not new age hippie, joysticks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They, they, they live in really stressful situations, and they have developed a technique which works. It's called box breathing, and it sounds absolutely bizarre the first time you hear it. You, you, you're all going to look at me like I've gone completely mad, but trust me, it works. Basically, how does it work? You breathe out all the way. You empty your lungs completely. Really big exhale. And then you hold your breath for four seconds. You count one, two, three, four. Then you breathe in through your nose over four seconds. And you hold your breath for four seconds. And then you breathe out through your nose for four seconds. And you repeat that 15 times. And at the end of that process, two really quite important things will have happened to you. First of all, the concentration of carbon dioxide in your blood will have increased a little bit. And 
that has an effect of dampening down the sympathetic nervous system. Remember, sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight one. It's a phenomenon called vagal inhibition. It dampens down the sympathetic nervous system, and after a minute, which is pretty much what you'll have after 15 times, you will find that your heart rate is dramatically lower than it was when you started the exercise. If you have an Apple Watch, I recommend that you just give it a go and you will be amazed at the difference it can make. The great thing about this is you can do it silently. Nobody needs to know that's what's going on. You've just taken a moment's quiet and you will come back from it in a much, much more under control situation than you would be at the start. So, what have we learned? Burnout is chronic long-term stress. Stress is basically an evolutionary leftover fight or flight response. You can learn to manage your sympathetic nervous system. This is what you might look like at the end of a project before you had some of these techniques. This is what you will look like at the end of the project using these techniques. And if you don't believe me, look at the way I look now. <laughs> <laughs>